All across the world, Halloween has become big business. And as a byproduct, horror events have also become a staple of theme and amusement parks. In fact, come October, in the United Kingdom especially, there are scare events all over the country. Every year, the National Forest Adventure Farm in Burton-on-Trent attracts families, young and old, from all over the country. But it's the farm's seasonal events that are really at its beating heart. Especially its annual horror event, Screamfest. Meet Andrew Porter, one of the world's most talented creatives in the land of theme park rides and scare attractions. His horror mazes have become legendary among enthusiasts, and many of them still exist as part of this annual event. Really started to immerse myself into themed experiences and storytelling to make people be whoever they want to be. But for the past two years, he's been working on something new something quite unique. I've been looking at this in 3D on CAD programs for the last six, seven months um, to come and see all the spaces taking shape and looking how the theory of design is working. With his new scare attraction, Insomnia. Um, part of design is, is looking at your space, what you want the audience to feel, what you want them to see. Andrew has worked in the themed entertainment industry all of his life and has given me some unprecedented access to his thought process as he set out to create a brand new horror attraction over two years in the making. It's not so much about the set design and all the props that's important, it's about the actual physical spaces, claustrophobia. But where did it begin, this love of theme parks? and horror attractions. Where did your initial love of theme parks and attractions come from? So um, I, was, I was terrified of theme parks and rides from a young age. I'd, I'd beg my parents to go to American Adventure and, and they'd take me for my birthday. My birthday parties there, but I would uh, scream, um, scream like crazy to go on the log through and, and the rides. I, I just didn't want to go on them, but I was obsessed by them. And it wasn't until I was 14 years old when I went to Alton Towers with a, a group of friends and um, the fear started to rise again and in the back of my mind I was thinking how am I going to get out of, out of doing this. The first ride that they were all running to was Nemesis and it was raining and a guy who I was with had been on Nemesis before was terrified and thinking well if he's scared then I probably should be too. So we joined the queue line, we went on it and I was trying to be brave and my plan was to reach the station platform run across the platform and run out the exit and uh, my, my friend at the time, uh, a guy called Lee Shout, grabbed hold of me, threw me into the seat, pulled down the restraint and said you're going to be on it and you're going to love it and I can still remember the, the, the first going up that lift hill and the fear and the, the anxiety and just, just thinking oh my god I'm going to die on this thing and to hitting the brake run and just having a full sense of, of, of accomplishment and pride and, 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 and joy about this and, and theme parks certainly became a place for me to escape and, and I and, and, and certainly from at school when I it was quite hard for me because I didn't really fit in and I was kind of an outcast and I was bullied quite badly because of it that theme parks became a, a sanctuary for me almost to get away and just enjoy being who I ever wanted to be I, I kind of got hooked on that, I, I fell in love with that idea and I wanted to give something back, I wanted to be a part of the industry and I really started to immerse myself into themed experiences and storytelling to make people be whoever they want to be, it doesn't matter, you can be whatever you want at a theme park and I, I still do that today. It started out as, as going roller coaster crazy. I had a rule of three, so if I saw a ride three times, I'd have to ride it. So Nemesis was the very first roller coaster I went on, but it was the year Oblivion in 1998 opened. 
I saw it three times before I went on that ride equally as terrified and, and finally got the courage to go on it and you know it was great and it, it started to come to me that I just started to see them as lumps of metal I mean the corkscrew was around was around then and, and certain rides were and I started to notice a great difference on experience when it came to a well themed ride where you've got the music, you've got the colour schemes, you've got the theme, you've got the storytelling and the stations to go on a ride which is just built on essentially what was a car park and it just had this thing rattling around around the track and it, it more became about the storytelling behind it and even today Oblivion's Q line is probably one of the best from a storytelling perspective out there. For some things there is no rational explanation. There is no way out. There is no happy ending to this story. Welcome to the unknown. Welcome to eternal darkness. Welcome to oblivion. <laughs>
and we demolished about 20% of the maze and rebuilt it and then added all of the detailed theming because we never take it down, it stays here all year round so we could do that. Here we are in Love Hurts and this is what it looks like pre-season. Um, there's no power in here, it's all off and it's waiting to come alive for, for the Halloween event. Um, at this time of the year we're doing a bit of refurb work, we're touching up the paint work, we're making sure all the electronics are working fine and starting to do the testing. Um, right now we are in August, beginning of, um, we've got two months to build the whole event where are there are six mazes that we have to build. Um, this is one of our most complex until Insomnia, which is the new one, which is even more complex than this one. So here we are in the cage section. Um, anyone who's been on this ride before, you would know what happens in here. But Professor Hartz's creatures, who are more zombie-like, who have been rejected, are hiding in here and the laser's keeping them down. Um, the guests come through here, they trigger the effects where we've got smoke, lighting, sound, and the zombies attack from either side as people are, are getting wet within the zone. Um, and as you can see, it doesn't look very scary right now, but as a designer, when you design a cage and you design a set, this is all our hardcore. Once you've put in your sound and you've put in your lighting and you've put in your special effects, really make it into a show, which at Screamfest we try to do more more every year to really put on a horror immersive show that's not too scary, that's not too cutthroat, but you'll always come out of our attractions either laughing or entertained. Um, the guests come up the ramp to the end and then carry on going through the rest of the maze into the sewer and through the rest of the attraction where Professor Hart is making more of his victims. So the great thing about Love Hurts is it's here all year round. We don't have to do a lot to it, we can just plug it in. But it's also the reason why it's our most themed attraction until Insomnia, which we're really pushing the boundaries of. People have been telling each other spooky stories since the dawn of time, but it was pioneers that turned them into attractions. Like Marie Tussaud, who in the early 1800s made gruesome wax models of noted traitors such as Mary Antoinette often at the bequest of the regime in order to keep her own head. But she eventually set up her own exhibition in London, dubbed the Chamber of Horrors. The rest, as they say, is history. In 1915, Orton and Spooner opened up what is possibly the world's oldest horror house. Remarkably, it still exists today. But it was Andrew's new maze insomnia that was really exciting me and it was three months before the opening of this new attraction that I was first invited to take a look at what he was doing. Everything has to be detailed at this stage so it can be costed. We can understand how much it's going to cost us to build it, how much wood goes into it, the panels that go up to building it. Um, and we have two months to take what you can see here and build it uh, and paint it and decorate it and get it ready with all the tech and program the tech to make it work. So we, we, know, we use normal panels you can buy off the shelf, they're 1220 by 2440. Um, we, 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 when we design the maze we're based on these little partitions walls where we've got our structure normal panel. So the 3D modelling that gets done we know it will fit into the space and the work I do is I give them dimension drawings. So this area in front of us, if we walk to the front, the scale is quite impressive, actually. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a big attraction. Um, this was originally Soul Seekers. Uh, Soul Seekers opened in 2013. In 2012, we opened Slasher, and. What happened was, is I learned to work with the farm. The farm learned to work with me and how I was a designer and how I stood out from what else was on the market. So we needed to change the event which had the barn and they were going to rebuild the barn. I designed Nocturnal and we looked at the quality of Nocturnal and what the barn was going to be and the farm asked me to look at the way the barn is designed and make it better. What I did is I uh, threw away the designs and I designed Soul Seekers, which turned out to be one of our most popular attractions that we've ever done. Um, the 
the, 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 what, what we are looking at is creating a brand new experience that is better than Soul Seekers, that hits a target audience age of 25 to 40, and the storyline that I've put together was based on a concept called Insomnia and the Nightmare Child. Insomnia. Um, insomnia is, is, it's been a long one for me. I originally wrote the story of Tabitha, it was about two and a half years ago, uh, when I wrote the idea of this um, little girl um, who's stuck in this nightmare realm. Um, the, this, the thing you can see on the screen at the moment on my, on, my, on my background is the original artwork for it, which was Insomnia, the Nightmare Child, and it's, it's really set in a time period of 1910 to 1920s. Um, I kind of wanted to hit that era just kind of at World War One time and just a little bit after and it's based it was based originally around a, a, um, a girls orphanage um, which these these nuns work at and and I started writing the story and and, and it, the original story of insomnia really fits more for stage kind of like woman in black I guess if you're gonna say anything or, or movie and I think whenever you come up with an idea for a terror house or a story or an attraction you should never really design it for something you should always think of the story and what you want to do and go could this work as a roller coaster could this work as a dark ride and a terror walkthrough insomnia didn't it didn't fit any of those it fit it fit a story for stage so it came to the year when we were looking at replacing soul seekers and and for anyone watching this video that, that knows what Soul Seekers is, it became a staple of Screenfest. It's it's very popular with the fans, it's been very popular with people, and it's been the staple of Screenfest. It's that traditional horror house which everyone expects to go to. So it, it wasn't it wasn't an easy decision for us to kind of go away from it and replace it with something new. It was it was an illog a logical approach where we'd we've done Love Hurts, which was Nocturnal's um, refurb which took Nocturnal and made it into Love Hurts which was it was always meant to be Nocturnal with theming and we never got to the theming stage which Love Hurts got to and it's a permanent attraction we don't take it down. In, with Soul Seekers it's, it's a temporary attraction it gets taken down every year and it gets rebuilt every year and Insomnia will be the same way but after doing Demonica we were testing the audience we were testing the audience to see if they wanted just that scare experience by having um, a great facade and a great pre-show um, a great pre-show and then guests go into what essentially is a dark maze and if that fear would work for them we quickly kind of found out that they, they, they liked the theme and they liked the storytelling which then led to a problem okay well we've got soul seekers it's the big one do we either lose freak out or do we lose soul seekers well freak out does very well it shouldn't go anywhere and soul seekers it's kind of run its course. So the decision was to replace Soul Seekers, go for an audience of that are about 25 to 40 plus, so it's a much older attraction, so it had to be, and it's got to be theatrical, it's got to be intelligent to a certain audience, um, whereas it's still got to entertain teenagers too, you can't alienate an audience. So it kind of goes down that slasher movie role model, it goes down the Nightbringer and the, the original concept of nocturnal and, and soul seekers. Then we've got all the problems about throughput of we now get 2,400 people at night at Screenfest that when we did Slasher we were only getting somewhere around about 600 700 a night. So when you tell stories you've, they're very difficult to do from a theatrical point of view. You've, you've, got to, you've got to set it up, people have got to know what they're doing, they've got to understand what they're doing, you've got to get these emotional hits where people are on your attraction and it hits them in a, on an emotional level. They, they've experienced it before, or oh, that's, that's my child has that problem, or my, my, my husband has that problem, or I'm scared of a dark, there's a murderer on the loose, or death penalties. And then you've kind of got to go into it to a certain degree without offending an audience and allowing them to come away with a, you've got a bipart, bi, bi partial sort of narrative that you've given to them. So all of those challenges laid ahead of us. And at the time I, I, I went to the farm and I had five different ideas for what they could have. And we spoke through those five different ideas and I thought, well, I've got insomnia. I've been working on it now for an awful long time and I think the audience is right, the story's right and from a little girl who's suffering from nightmares 
but the original story being in the 1920s didn't work, so I went and rewrote it, and we came up with the story of Cracker Jack, who's in Tabitha's head, and he is causing her to have serious nightmares, and Tabitha's got the ability to bring people into her dreams to save her from Cracker Jack. So now we've got a narrative there that makes sense why you are going into her dream, you're going into her dream to save her. And we've had a lot of fun on this attraction, looking at the choreography of how we get that story across to our guests, from the living room of Evelyn, who's Tabitha's mother, who's trying to put her to sleep, and she's suffering from nightmares, and she won't go to sleep, and she keeps stopping. Tabitha is trying to talk to her mum, but she can't hear her while Cracker Jack's coming through. Time speeds up again, Evelyn has a go at Tabitha because she thinks she's playing up. All of this time, Tabitha is talking to the audience. She can see the audience and she's telling the audience about the White House with the red roof and the red door. You've got to find me there, you've got to save me there. Why Evelyn, her mother, can't see any of the audience. So she's dusting the audience down and she's talking to Tabitha. All your imaginary friends are getting really crazy now, Tabitha. You know, you know, you should try and make some friends of your own. So we were, we're playing that up and then as you go through into the bedroom, you can now see Cracker Jack getting really stronger. And the bit where we start the experience is you get called into Tabitha's dream. So all of that build up at the beginning of the attraction is our pre-show that we used to be in Soul Seekers. We've now taken and, and changed the way it works by telling people what the storyline is in the queue line, getting those emotional hits introducing the character of Cracker Jack so when you go into the attraction you start walking around it for the next eight nine minutes you understand those character roles and what your part is in that dream and what I'm really hoping for with insomnia that when people leave the attraction they 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 think back certainly the older audience they think back to all the stuff they saw from the queue line all the way through the attraction where it makes them think about their own families their own nightmares they have and their own kids that they call the babysitter up and say to them is, is she okay or is he okay you know are they fine well right now and um, where we're filming this is going to be the living room and this will look like a normally family living room. There's going to be a TV here, there's going to be a couch in here, the walls are going to look like a normal living room. We're going to have two actors in this living room. One is going to be Evelyn, who's Tabitha's mother, who is trying to get Tabitha to sleep. And we obviously have Tabitha. The whole story of Tabitha going to sleep and bringing the guests into her dream starts here. It's, she's tired, it's bedtime, so that reality is breaking down. Tabitha can see the audience and she can talk to you. She's continuously drawing this white house with a red door and a red roof. And she keeps telling you about this white door with a red, doof, uh, red, red roof and red door. Come and find me, it's my safe place. While the guests are in this space, there's going to be six different events. Tabitha is going to be watching TV. The phone's going to ring. Someone's going to be knocking at the door. Someone's going to be at the window. Time is going to slow down, Evelyn is going to stop, Tabitha is going to start to become more panicked as Cracker Jack starts to come into the room, into the area. Then Tabitha will start to scream uncontrollably, all the lights will change and time will instantly speed up again. And Evelyn will be like, Tabitha, why are you screaming? What's going on? Because Evelyn's got no idea what's just happening to Tabitha. She'll be quite frustrated, you're going to bed Tabitha, I'm not paying this game. So we're introducing that story into here of what the guest role is, why Tabitha's asking for their guest help all the time. As the guests move into the next space, which is going to be in this corner, you're actually going to be inside Tabitha's bedroom. And Tabitha's going to be in bed, she's going to be right here, in bed. There's going to be another door here, which is going to link up to this one here. And this is where Evelyn's going to be, the actress of Evelyn's going to be hidden. And Tabitha's going to be lying in bed here, and then we have one of the iconic wardrobes, Tabitha's wardrobes with the flowers on right here. And there's going to be three events in this room where Tabitha's starting to go to sleep. Evelyn's going to leave the room and there's going to be a lonely night light and the guests are going to be stood where you are. I'm in the actor space. And the three events are the crack jack appears at the window which is going to be pretty much right where this wall is and he's going to be able to peer in at the guests here. Tabitha's going to wake up at this point and start screaming uncontrollably. Evelyn's going to enter through the door and start saying, Tabitha, you are going to go to sleep. You're, I'm not having this anymore. She's going, Mummy, Mummy, the cracker man, the cracker jack's going to come and get me, he's going to come and get me. 
So everything's then going to go and watch the wardrobe. She's going to open the wardrobe. There's nothing in the wardrobe. She's going to look under the bed. She's going to look out the windows. There's nothing to be seen. So she settles Tabitha down and she disappears. Eventually, what will happen is Cracker Jack will be inside the wardrobe. She'll press the button again, and he is going to run out of that wardrobe and attack the queue line. And he's going to be right there in front of their faces. He's going to be freaking out. He's going to have his full makeup on and dress on. And it's something that we've never done before. Tabitha is obviously going to be freaked out that the Cracker Jack is in the room with everyone. Evelyn, Cracker Jack's going to run back into the wardrobe. Evelyn's going to come into the room and say, what is going on with all this chaos that's happening within this space? So in these first two rooms, we've introduced the story. We've introduced the narrative. We've introduced everything that's going on. There's a child that's got this nightmare. You're here to save Tabitha from the nightmare. And the guests then are ushered into the next part of the maze. Andrew's enthusiasm was utterly infectious. And at times during this process, it was easy to forget just how much was really at stake. Um, you've got to imagine from a designer's point of view, I've just spent the last two and a half years developing the story and the last year doing all the design work and, and all of the drawings and all of the 3D models and working out the spaces and the choreography and how they all work together. So it's an exciting time to see it all being built, but uh, at the same time there's been a lot of investment by other parties into it. So I'm responsible not only that the maze is good and you guys all enjoy it out there, I'm also responsible for the investment that if this isn't right or doesn't work and the reviews come out bad then I'm the one who's solely to blame for that. It was about three or four weeks since I last saw Andrew Porter um, and construction was just beginning on the scare attractions here. Let's go and see how he's been getting on. The progress had been quite remarkable and it was time to start painting the walls and theming the attraction. Make no mistake of the scale of the task ahead of them. To paint or set up 157 wooden panels 17 window panels, 43 mirror panels, 46 LED cans, 44 speakers, 5 subwoofers, 4 haze machines, 2 smoke machines, 5 fans, 6 smell pods, 11 actor switches, 50 meters of LED tape, 21 actors, 4 Tabithas, 6 Cracker Jacks and 4 magnetic lock systems. No, all of the walls and all of the drawings are pre-worked out. We know what the colours need to be. We, we do psychology based on colour design too, to make people feel a certain way. If you've got children of your own, and if you own your own house, or you've been in a normal house, you'll see the colour schemes that you've used in the maze are of what you have in your own house. It's again that psychology thing. I feel comfortable because I know this, because I live in it. So to take something that's comfortable and known to the person looking at your attraction, you were already started on that psychology of, of, of what people feel within it. This feels like my daughter's bedroom, or this feels like our living room. And those little details of what's playing on the radio, or what you can hear outside, or what you hear on TV, or things that you, you would normally hear in your room will also be played inside the attraction. We want people to really, really feel like they're in their home in, in this attraction before it gets back. That's, that's the psychology part of it. Crucial to this process is Julie Tickle. She'd been working on the event for almost a decade, and with Andrew for most of that time as well. I wanted to know what she thought of the theory behind his latest creation. Um, yes, I like it. It's, it's quite different to what Andy's previously sort of done. We're really sort of getting into the back of Andy's warped mind, I think, now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It's a scary place to yes, be. Yes, yeah. I think, um, yeah, when it's all done, we, it's, it's a great concept. I mean, have you actually discussed your concept? We, we, we have. Right, so yeah, so, um, I mean, child nightmares, that's where your fears begin. The White House, with the red roof and the red door. Uh, I spend a lot of my time um, throughout the rest of the year creating art, um, and then we prep a couple of months in advance, which, which unfortunately doesn't prepare us for the fact that we only get around about six to eight weeks actually on set, don't we? So yeah. there's a lot to be done. Even though there's a lot going on in the background, um, that we're probably, we start work on Halloween, probably the day after Halloween <laughs> the following year. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we like to be, especially with the makeup side of things, we're prepped and ready around about um, April, May time for that. But 
put an into motion regarding set building and set painting the Albion get about eight weeks. So time is definitely against us most of the time. I think on time as well with the, the, the attractions that we do here at Screenfest, they are of theme park quality. They're, they're a lot bigger, they're a lot more eccentric than you get at other places. And you've got to remember that when you're walking around Insomnia, this will be taken down. And it'll be down and after a week after Halloween it'll be stored and then it'll be put back up next year because they use this building for other things. So as Judy was saying, we don't have a lot, long time to build these very elaborate eccentric sets just because they've been using this space all of summer. We, we have a month to build it, a month to paint it and then open it. And then I give it to Judy and then she's got to worry about getting the actors ready for it. And then we have to operate it. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure another video later down in this, uh, this, this piece of film, you'll see Judy in a totally different light. A lot greyer. <laughs> And eccentric language <laughs> is, is quite common. <laughs> We're back at the National Forest Adventure Farm. I was here about four weeks ago and this place um, was just a shell really and some of the maze is really coming to life. Um, let's hear a bit more from Andrew about what he's been doing over the last few weeks. Here we are in a perfect place. This is the, uh, the room which is going to be a real change in, in insomnia when you walk into tap of the drawing. Um, and it's, it's, quite, it's quite an exciting time for me as a designer. I've been looking at this in 3D on CAD programs for the last six, seven months um, to come and see all the spaces taking shape and looking how the theory of design is working. You can already feel the sense of the attraction changing. Um, part of design is, is looking at your space, what you want your audience to feel, what you want them to see. It's not so much about the set design and all the props that's important. It's about the actual physical spaces, the claustrophobia, the colours. So Tabitha's bedroom is pink. The first room is a beige colour and this one's a light blue. After this room, the attraction starts to really get dirty. But if you notice when you come here, the spaces are still pretty generous. When you start to understand the colour schemes change, the lighting change and the sounds change, we then start to squeeze the audience in. And the best example for that is in the nightmare room, where the floor is raised, the ceiling is lowered and the walls come in. Uh, when you're stood in that room now, just as, as a point, it feels like a normal room and you can start to feel the pulling well in, in, in your shins that the actual floor is going up. It's a really strange feeling. So what we do then is once we've, 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 we've removed the height, from a room, you go into a back alley, which is going to be like a Jack the Ripper sort of scene, but it's double height. So the walls are very contained, it's like a back alley, with very, 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 very tight walls, but the ceiling is very, very high. And you can already feel that, that psychology working in here. tight but the room's very tight and then we squeeze the room even more until the very end of the attraction where we get generous again you give people a feeling they can run they can move and you're almost letting them go it's the control throughput it gets people moving quickly but it also creates a great sense of panic also being ran out by the actor cracker jack at that point so this is where we are um, it's going to move quite quickly from this point on um, and it's just having the experience of doing this for a long period of time, understanding where your acts are, understanding where your actors are, and then also designing and understanding where all your text going to go. For instance, in this room, we've got a nightlight which is going to do a starscape. When Tabitha is going to go to sleep, there'll be a soft lullaby playing. There's lights outside above these windows. There's one outside this one, there's another one outside there. There's lights in the ceiling. So when Evelyn comes into the room, she can turn the lights on like you would do. Your child is screaming, she's had a nightmare. You come into the bedroom, you turn the lights on. So then she'll settle Tabitha down, she'll go out, she'll turn the lights off, which will just leave the nightlight going. We've got lights inside the wardrobe for Cracker Jack, and we also have a strobe light on this back wall. So when Cracker Jack runs out of the wardrobe, we can strobe the whole scene and chaos happens, as well as the subwoofers and sound system that's coming in here as well. So 
you've got to think about that. The biggest challenge with this maze is, is taking the story of insomnia, changing it to work in a horror house environment. The original story of insomnia is not the story you're going to experience in this maze. Having respect for parents, having respect for children, um, this, this horror maze is, 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 is aimed at some pretty sensitive things. It's having respect for all of those things and keeping it light. One thing that I do in my horror bases, and I've always done, is I don't traumatise people. I'm purely an entertainer. I like to entertain people. I take them up to a limit, and then we normally address it with comedy relief. We present people's situations, but there's always the lighter side of it. And here at Screenfest, I feel that we do a very good job of making people laugh, making people have fun, and more importantly, giving people good, happy memories to take with them. That's why I do what I do. So th this kind of work is, the, the industry in, in, in the UK has boomed. I mean, I, I started on, the, on this industry in 2012, before I was, I was pottering around, but 2012 Slasher opened. And in the temporary maze industry, no one had ever seen anything like Slasher before. I bought a lot of technology over from America. I, I, I knew how to write shows and choreograph shows and Slasher was my, my first attempt. Since then in the UK, there's been so many more events that have opened. Um, and, and that's the challenge of, of, of seeing what the industry is trying to be unique is is a big thing for me you know the zombies there's loads of zombie attractions there's loads of hotels out there now there's loads of these stereotypical sort of attractions you get so when we did love hurts love hurts was our zombie attraction it was these creatures that had been made by professor hart that he'd rejected because they weren't right for his Bride of Frankenstein that he was building in the background. So Professor Hart decided he was going to do a dating evening in this Victorian pub that he'd bought behind his ancient sewage work where he was, he was doing all these experiments on. He would then take those rejects and throw them into different areas and kind of categorise them in, as, as levels of failure with the old idea that if you can make it through all of those, those creatures, then you are strong enough to be on his Bride of Frankenstein and he might take your eye or he might take your leg or might take your arm. And it was a, it was a unique way for us to explore the, the, the zombie horror. Um, obviously, that's then got its difficulties from a marketing perspective that we've just created a unique brand and a unique attraction that no one knows anything about and sometimes the easiest thing to do is just say we've done a zombie attraction because everybody knows what zombies are because it's everywhere um, so those those are the difficult challenges of taking your ideas as a creative and selling them into a company that believes in you so much that they actually build them. Because quite honestly, what you end up doing is you go and present these ideas to people, and they go, oh, I just want a zombie attraction, I just want a ghost attraction, and, and they go back into those, those sorts of cliches. So those, those are the, the biggest challenges that I've had um, on those. And, and the biggest challenges I've had on insomnia, really, again, is, 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 is taking a concept and getting it up to this stage. Um, is, is a huge amount of work to have a load of people believe in what you're selling. You know, out of the five concepts that I came up with, Insomnia was the one that I've, I've pushed forward to, to be built because I believe it's the right and the best thing to do. Um, um, apart from that, in, Insomnia is, 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 a, is an amalgamation of, 
oh, since 2012 of theory that I've written over those years and we've tested all the theory that's in insomnia. The only bit of theory that's never been tested that's in, in, in insomnia is the cue line engagement with the audience. One of the th trends that we're noticing in, in current audiences and, and certainly in the industry as a whole is um, the millennial generation are they want everything now. They don't want to queue for things. They they want instant gratification. And and there's there's reports coming out of anxiety on mobile phones if they don't if they see the little the, the circle that loads. So quite often what you see if you go to Disney or Merlin Parks or Universal Parks or even at our horror parks is people are just attached to their mobile phones. I've even seen people in pre-shows that are texting or Facebooking. So is it possible? to do something so hard hitting, so immersive and engaging within a queue line that people put their phones away and actually start to connect with what you're trying to sell. So one of the other events that we're doing in the queue line is we're having this connection with TV and children watching TV and, and parents' reaction with, with what their, their kids watch on it. And um, we put through together a quite a funny sequence that goes quite badly and you'll, you'll see the juxtaposition between the two ways that, that they've done. So Evelyn, uh, Tabitha goes and asks Evelyn, her mother, if she can watch television and Evelyn's like, yes, you can watch t TV, Tabitha, but don't watch anything scary. So she turns on the TV and she comes to this. She's not really bothered about watching this, so she changes channel. And here's a TV advert for Nocturnal Nightclub. Healthy cattle will only be admitted. She's not interested in that, so she changes channel again and uh, sees adverts again. Slash of the movie is just finished and the credits are rolling. She changes channel again and comes back to the one she was on before. Um, not really too interested in this. So she changes again. And all the time, Evelyn's doing some work in the background. Tabitha changes to a horror TV channel. Evelyn says, Tabitha, turn it off. You're not allowed to watch horror. You know you're not. So she changes to a children's TV show. And you will notice that the background is a perfect place from the attraction. Did you enjoy Timmy Beagle's big farm show today? Because I did. We're best friends. Now, shall we see some of the drawings that have been better than that blue one? He's recording. Yeah. Sorry. It's all right. So it's just just dis 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 disrupt the. Uh, they're filming, why don't you? How long have you worked for the National Adventure Farm? I've been working here for just over two years. Do you enjoy it? I love working here. It's like one great big family. Next one, we've got a drawing from Rosie, age seven. And she's drawn a big teddy, teddy bear that she's given a big cuddle to. Got quite a lengthy part of the host talking about all of these children and things to make the audience go, what are we watching? It's just a kids TV programme. So when we change the event and Cracker Jack takes over, which is such a juxtaposition, it really strocks everyone watching. So we'll have thunder and lightning flashing out the windows, the lights start to fail, the soundtrack is going to go Tabitha, Tabitha. <laughs> what we're doing is there's different parts in that cue line where the actress playing Tabitha can interact with the audience, but also starting to get the story across. So she's going to have buttons all around that set in the living room. One button's going to be by the door, one button's by the telephone, one's by the table that she's drawing on, and one's by a TV. And the TV idea is Tabitha will go and sit on a beanbag and she'll turn on the television. And there'll be a few programs that she's going through, so it'll be like a cheesy advert will come up and then she'll go, I don't want to watch that. A gardening program may come up, I don't want to watch that. Until eventually she comes to what you're doing. 
you know, your children's presenter, so she'll come to you and she'll flick on there and then she'll start to watch your programme. And then the host takes over. Lovely job. So that's a long lead up to what we're doing with you today, that you are the TV host that, that will go through and is all jolly and nice and oh we've just come back from watching Tiddle Winks, is that a programme? We've got to make sure it's not a real programme, we need to make up a programme yeah. or something. Fuzzy bears or something, you know. Fuzzy oh, bears. weren't they? You know, weren't for the fuzzy bear adventures and fuzzy bear adventures. Fuzzy bears fuzzy adventures. Bear adventures. Can you believe that fuzzy bear? And you know, can you believe that fuzzy bear and all this crazy, crazy stuff he got up to? Now, <laughs> those cheesy things that she was doing on that program. I mean, I'm going to go and get you a glass of water as well because I'm going to need one. So you can carry on watching milkshake just to start, you know, playing around with that stuff. Okay. Before we turn the camera on and start filming, we'll do a few takes. I think that's quite nice to put in there. Just keep it quite light. There's no right or wrong on this. So it's just ad lib. Absolutely. The yeah. important thing that we need to get in there is we need to probably do two pictures before Tabitha's. So we'll have Billy or Dave or John, age four. Whatever you make up, I've got to draw, by the way. So, you know, you can, you know no, don't worry about it because it's quite funny. You can be quite, you know, in your head. Oh, look, he's drawn a camel and I'll draw an elephant or something. And just, it would just be that stupid where the picture of an elephant comes up and you'll be, and, and, and the name will be wrong and you'll say somebody else's name completely different. Oh, it's a giraffe and I've drawn a seal. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just stupid because then people will be watching it going, you know, what's going on. So Evelyn is off the camera to the left where the host looks at Evelyn. He's looking at Tabitha's mum. Now Tabitha is really freaking out and getting scared. All the lights are pulsing, the bass is hitting, and eventually it just stops. Evelyn comes back to life again. Tabitha is screaming in absolute hysteria and going crazy. Ta Evelyn will run over to Tabitha and calm her down. When Tabitha calms down, Evelyn will turn around and look at the television. She's watching Soul Seekers Live, which she's not allowed to watch. It's a horror program. So she tells Tabitha off, you're not allowed to watch this. How many times have I told you you can't watch horror? So she grabs hold of the remote control, looks at the TV, and after we've got a great scream, she turns the TV off and the queue line returns to normal. We're very excited about the queue line. It's something unique. We're hoping that people put their mobile phones away and it's so shocking where we've got these moments of a mum having a nice moment singing a lullaby with her to this child turning into a temper tantrum that she just doesn't understand what's going on. All of this built up to the end of the attraction when people come out to hopefully for them that they, they, they connect with the attraction. It's, it's pretty exciting. By late September, the maze was almost ready, and many of the screens.
in first actors were going through their paces, especially rehearsing insomnia for the very first time. <laughs> Even in rehearsals, the actors were bringing Andrew's dream of insomnia to life. Over 120 scare actors make up the event and it's quite a sight to see them go through their warm-up routines. at her most frenzied. Amazingly, she actually let me talk to her as she prepared multiple actors at once for the opening night of Insomnia and Screamfest 2018. Hello again. Can I ask what you're turning him into? He's going to be Cracker Jack. Oh, wow. And this one, your mum is going to be Cracker Jack as well. So do you usually do them two at the same time when you've got... Um... Um, this is the first year when I've done dual painting, so... I've done well, I say, I'm set up to do dual painting. How many uh, people's faces will you make up this evening? We have got... <laughs> Lots of people! With the actors in makeup, fully rehearsed, the maze fully built, and most of the theory tried and tested, it was time to open Insomnia.
place we are now. You'll never run old Crackerjack. Up. It's it's more than just a jump scare maze. It, it plays with your mind quite a lot because the initial scene and acting is really good from the off, and then each scene works together. That it all pieces together so well, but it's such a, a mental scare as well because the whole time you're going through it, you're thinking to yourself, "This could give me nightmares later on after I've done it." And it's just so well put together that I can really appreciate a, a scare with such a good story and it has a good story because it paints a picture at the start of every scene really well put together and i like the whole idea that you're stepping into like the child's drawing and you're in that like drawing world i think it really works really really well Get this excited about anything at a theme park, a roller coaster, or a scare attraction. I've never been so scared in my life. I'm sweating, all the hairs in the back of my neck are up. I'm really tall. So well executed, absolutely fantastic. 
What's been the biggest challenge now? It's now it's up and running. Can you look back? The, the, the biggest challenge is, is is making sure all of those designs fit from the three D model to the sound to the lighting to the actors and how they engage with the set. The biggest challenges that we have now is open is working out the attraction management. How are guests making their way through the attraction? What tweaks can we make? Is the sound correct in certain places? So over the next couple of days, we'll be making those tweaks, getting the feedback from the actors to make sure that it works. And that's what preview is all about. Anything you do differently? Oh, um, I think I would add, um, I'd add more special effects in there. I, I think on the long corridor where we've got the wind coming through, we could have, we could have had a projector in there with some sort of wraith coming down the corridor hits the audience before the, the air effects go off, just to make it a little bit, add something else to it, increase those levels on there, but the way the attraction's designed, the way it's working from narrative, I, I, I don't think we could have done much more. Since working in this industry, Andrew has always tried to give something back. In fact, it's testament to him that on the opening night of Insomnia, he stayed behind for over an hour to show some very excited enthusiasts around his new scare attraction and how everything worked. I asked his advice for anyone watching who might be interested in doing the kind of work that he does. If someone wants to get into this, there aren't too many college courses about the stuff that you do and some of the stuff you, you, you and your colleagues have done in the past. What advice would you give to someone of a young age, shall we say, going into college or just about to take some of those steps um, to do this sort of work? Yeah, uh, this is this is a question I, I get asked a lot and, and I wish I had the answer. I really do wish I could say on this, do this and, and you'll get it. The industry, if you want, if you, it depends what area of the industry you want to go into. If you take a route that I, I've gone into, where I, I concept and I, and I design and I build a theme park attractions, it's, it's, it's many, many, it's being good at a lot of things, but being great at one thing. So, for instance, um, I'm a storyteller, I concept attractions, I write them. I like to think I'm great at it, I think I've got a long way to go, I'm not going to go that far, but I'm also good at programming, I've got a good understanding of theatrical lighting, I've got a good understanding of choreography and actors and scripting. Which then when you do a horror attraction, which hopefully you'll see on this film as we go through, is all important for when you direct a video that you're using in the attraction. And you've got to think about how that video is going to work with the actors in the area. So you're, you're filming, a, you've got an actor in front of you who's doing a piece to camera on a children's TV show, which you'll see in Insomnia. And you've got to imagine that there's nothing else around. You know, there's, you're in a... You're in a random attic somewhere with people drilling around, you can hear kids play and all this sort of stuff. You've got to begin a mindset to work at that and think, okay, there'll be an actress called Tabitha interacting with that TV. Evelyn, the mother, will be reacting with that TV. So when the actor on the TV looks to the left or right, you've got to think on the set that you've designed, where's Tabitha going to be sat so he makes eye contact with her? Where's Evelyn going to be stood so he can look at the mum? And it's making those eye contacts. So um, getting into the industry is, is, is you've just got to believe in yourself, you've got to get out there, you've got to experience theme parks, you've got to go to museums, you've got to, you've got to look at those rides and think, why have the designers done what they have done? What decisions did they do to do those? And if you could, how could you add to it? What would you do that would make it better? Start writing reviews about all of the stuff that you do, all the experiences. What did you like? What didn't you like? What did you hear people saying around those experiences? Use that to create a 10-page presentation on a ride or a story that you put together that you think could work quite well. Because when you start getting involved in that level of detail, you're going to force yourself to go, I would love to create a horror attraction out of this. Okay, so what what do I need to learn to do there? Architecture, space planning, what's out there for me to do? And, and the initial start of it in this industry comes from passion. You have to be passionate in this industry because it is so small and there's so few people that do it. So when you start doing that and looking at that, when you start engaging with people when in the industry, you're going to start talking their same language. And as soon as you start talking their language, you start to get noticed and you start to get heard that this guy knows what he's doing. 
if you can go to any festivals, there's the European Attraction Show, which is quite good, and go and talk to the companies that are on those stands. That's a great What's thing. What's great about it, the European Show is all the key people are here. You've got a very high concentration of the leaders of the industry who would never dream of not being here. So it is actually a really exciting place to be. In the UK, if you go to Scarecon in the UK and you uh, go and talk to those guys because it's an uh, open industry and there's a lot of people that do it for charity, you're quite likely to get work with them. And it may be free work. I mean, the amount of free stuff I did at the beginning of, of, of my, of my um, um, journey on this was huge. Um, I, I had five jobs going at one time just to be able to be able to do this and get to a certain stage. It's a long, long road. You can look at university, theatrical courses are good, but quite honestly, instead of just diving straight into that, go and find a local playhouse, go and find a local theatre, go and find a local amateur group and get involved with the pantomimes. Start set designing, start set painting, start looking at colours and how all that goes together. If you want to build animatronics, have a go. I'm in the room, I've got one sat over there. Um, Start looking at DMX and show controls and how it all goes together. How can you make that light in the corner flash? And is that going to be a thunder light? Is it going to be a prop light? Um, and hopefully if, if you're interested and you come to Insomnia, start looking at why I've put lights, why there are smoke machines, why there are sounds, why there are horrendous smells in places. You know, why, why would you spend £50 on a scent dispenser and go and buy fart smell? You know, from someone, why would you do that? What does that do? Everyone goes, oh, it's a horrible smell. But what do they do when they do that? They go, oh, it's a horrible smell. When you've just gone, oh, it's a horrible smell to your family, what you haven't seen is the actor has now come out of a hole. So you go, oh, it's a horrible smell, turn around and there's a guy right there in your face. It's distraction. It's used to distract. It's used to make people look over here when they should be looking over there and oh an act is going to jump out of that very obvious door it's not the door you need to be worried about it's, it's, it's the hidden fridge that's in the corner that a corpse jumps out of so once you start doing it and you start engaging and you start start drawing and pulling all these items together you're going to get very quickly work out what it is an in industry that you want to be and then you're going to start to get a very good idea of what you need to do and how you need to get there and everybody's journey every designer I talk to everyone that you will talk to every story is different but every single one starts with I had a passion for theme parks I had a passion for theatre or I had a passion for storytelling every single one of them and good luck <laughs> Nothing more than a conjure with your cheap tricks. That's right. <laughs> yeah. that's right. That's cool, right. that'll do, I think. My time with Andrew for now was at an end, and I could not thank him enough for the time and insight he gave me into his thought process, his theory, and the eventual execution. Thank you for watching, and if you've enjoyed what you've seen, please do subscribe. I'll see you next time on Theme Park World Tour.